Take out our Bibles. Second hey. Timothy chapter two, very familiar portion of scripture for us here at least. Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy chapter two. And let's see. Let's begin reading in Verse 13, verse 13. We'll read a few of these here. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13 says, If we believe not, yet he by the faithful, he cannot deny himself. So in other words, we need to line ourselves up with God's truth. What he says is absolutely true. And so when I answer these questions, I that's what I want to do. Then verse 14. Of these things, of these things, put them in remembrance. And like we've said before, preaching really is just a reminder to Christians of uh, what, what the truth is. Just a reminder. Charging them before the Lord. Charging them like you charge somebody with a, a ministry. Charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit. There's sometimes questions can be asked to try to trip somebody up, striving, looking for an argument. That's not the idea here. It says don't do that. That they strive not about words to no profit. Just arguing about things is no profit. But to subverting the hearers, people will get tripped up and they'll not understand things. And in verse 15, study. Study to shew thyself approved unto God. A workman, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know what that means? You need to know the Bible. Then verse 16, but shun profane and vain babblings. There's a lot of false things being taught for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat. Now, this is interesting. And their word will eat as doth a canker. Like a canker, it grows. So when people te teach them the wrong things and bring up the wrong kind of or false things, talk about their word, their word will eat as doth a canker. It grows. So lies do not stay stagnant. They do not stay in one place. They grow. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred. So we named two men here that were going the wrong way, have erred, have gone off the wrong doctrine, teaching wrong doctrine, false doctrine, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. It's caused some people to stumble in their faith. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Turn from those sins, Christian. Depart from iniquity. But in the great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood of earth, and some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use. That's why we want to be right with God. That's why we want to get our lives right, so we can be used of the Lord. You know, direct us, protect us, correct us, encourage us. Use us. Use us, Lord. Heavenly Father, bless tonight. Help me as I answer these questions. A lot of different questions, good questions. But Lord, help me to explain them clearly. Help me to give good answers, Bible answers, of course, Lord, according to your word. But just help me tonight. Bill, there's a lot of questions, Lord, I'm going to go through here. So help me to make it clear, each and every one. Each and every one. Help me tonight. In Jesus' name, I pray and ask it. Amen. Amen. All right. I want to do something here real quick. I had a couple last minute ones come in. I want to kind of get them in a certain order here. Okay. These top four came in tonight, and some were just handed to me less than five minutes ago. Now, this one was tonight, not one of the five minute questions. The King James, King James Version was or is inspired and is and was completed in 1611. Does this mean that it is possible for an inspired translation to be made in the future? Here's the key, in a different language, in a different language, say Spanish. It's kind of interesting Spanish was mentioned. It was about five, ten years ago, maybe a little bit longer. There was a big, uh, uh, what's the word, dispute over some Spanish, a Spanish translation that was not using the, the, uh, the right manuscripts. But anyways, can, in other words, can the, can the Bible, God's Word, be inspired in a different language, is what it's saying. Also, another language, King, King James Version, can't be translated back because of archaic words. So it's only the English language KJV inspired. 
No, as long as you use the right manuscripts, that's the key. You have to use the right manuscripts. The manuscript that was used in the Old Testament for the King James, and the manuscript that was used for the New Testament. So if you want to make a Spanish translation, you don't use the King James Bible to use that, to do that. You use the manuscript, the manuscripts that were used for the King James Bible, and that any other Bible in other, other language needs to use the same uh, manuscripts, manuscripts. That's the key, the manuscripts there is the key. Also, if God is going to uh, bless a, a translation into another language, and by the way, he can and he does. In, in the book of Acts, there are 15 different languages. They heard, their, they heard the word of God in their language, 15 different ones. And it was the word of God, the word of God. And they're in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost. Uh, but it has to be the right manuscripts. And God in back of it, too. You can tell if God's in back of it or if he isn't. Number two, another question. Oh, why do Christians think they have to work for their salvation? It's not a free gift, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You know, for by grace I say through faith, not of works, as they mentioned both. Uh, but what, if they're a Christian, they should understand that. If you're not working for salvation. If they're really a Christian, they're born again, and they know that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. They surrender, they bow the knee, they've been born again. And if they've been born again, there's a difference in that person's life. How can the Holy Spirit of God come into someone's life and there not be a difference? Yeah. There's going to be a difference. There's going to be a difference when they're born again. So why do Christians think, the ones that think this are the ones that really aren't Christians then. Right. They think they have to work for their salvation. They're not really Christians. They need to understand it. Yeah. It is a gift given to those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So yeah, that's a good question. A real basic question. But, but what we need to explain to people, don't we? We need to explain that to them clearly. Next question. Oh, uh, this is one of those five-minute questions. Can a single person, Christian, marry a divorced person? Now, this is, when you get into the area of divorce, you get into the area that is so, there's so many thoughts on so many, well, they even disagree on it. It depends on the situation. I'd have to know more situation, the more details of the situation than, can a single person, Christian, marry a divorced person? Well, why do they get divorced? Is their past uh, mate? Have they gotten remarried again? That's being about. So there's a lot more questions have to be answered, asked and answered before. I can really answer a question like this. Can a single person or Christian marry a divorce? Now, hope, should, you should, how, do you, how do I say this? It'd be better not to, but there's times when it's all right. It depends on the specific situation. So can a single Christian marry a divorced person? Uh, Again, it depends. It depends. Sometimes it's yes. Sometimes it's no, depending on the situation. What about somebody, well, like I said, there's so many different options there. What if the, the Christian, the divorced person, their mate, they divorced their mate, then their mate died in the meantime. And there's so many different options here in this situation. But can a single person, you have to have no more information on that, more information about that situation. But it's not, it's not an absolute yes or no on that, but it's contingencies, what's involved in that. All right, another one was uh, tonight's question. <coughs> in Je John chapter 13, verse 27. <coughs> John 13, verse 27. See, in fact, a couple of the questions tonight, we need more, I need more details on it. It's not a yes or no on some of these. John chapter 13, verse 27. Uh, here's the question. When the Lord said, that thou doest do quickly, was he talking to Judas, or was he saying it to Satan? Because Satan had really prompted and even indwelt Judas to say these things. So John chapter 13, verse 27. And after the south, Satan entered into him, meaning Judas, then said Jesus unto him, uh, that thou doest do quickly. Now I would say he was saying this to Judas, because in verse 27 there again, let's look at verse 27 a little slower here. And after the sup, that's a part of the food, a uh, Satan entered into him. So who's the him? Judas. Him is Judas. Then said Jesus unto him, who's the him there? Judas. So I believe it would be Judas. That thou doest do quickly. That thou doest do quickly. So he's talking to Judas there. Judas, I know what you're going to do. I do it quickly. That's, uh, that's what the Lord said there. 
that thou doest do quickly. So I think that him, because it's defined in the first part of verse 27, him is being uh, Judas. Then says Jesus unto him, you need Judas also then. I, I think that would be the thing. But yet, Satan was in back of that. How in the world can Satan enter somebody? Well, I think in the Bible it talks about someone's going to be indwelt by, who's that? The Antichrist. Satan incarnate. Jesus Christ is God incarnate. The Antichrist will be Satan incarnate. Satan will possess a man in that way. In that way. It's possible now for devils to possess a man too, isn't it? They can get into that horrible situation. Okay, next question. Is it wrong for a woman to rebuke a preacher for wrong doctrine, using a verse to back up his wrongdoing? Um, and again, this is one of those, I need more information on this one too. What's the doctrine exactly? Uh, and the, the, see, for a woman to rebuke a, a preacher, if she's married, maybe the man or husband should, should talk to him. But the word rebuke to is a strong word there. You have to make sure you're right now. You know, that's why I need more information about this too. I need more specifics. What in particular is the situation? And also, whenever uh, a real motive, we need to be sincere about things too. What's our real motive sometimes? Sometimes we need to think about that. We need to, what is our real motive for asking this question? People are going to ask questions because they're trying to get somebody, get at somebody. So they can ask questions for that. I'm not saying this is a situation here, but I'm saying you have to be careful. You have to understand and realize and really know the person's heart. And we don't always know the person's heart. God does. God does. We don't always know the real motive why people ask questions. It could be a sincere question. It could be. But there could be other reasons for it, too. And maybe there's no Bible example of, of this. Uh, Paul himself, he, of course, he confronted Peter, and Paul had his problems with the Judaizers, the ones that uh, criticized him and they attacked him. So he defended himself and backed them up about the wrong doctrine. And of course, much of the Bible, New Testament, in Paul's writings, is to correct wrong doctrine. So what what point at what point do you go after that to rebuke a preacher for wrong doctrine? I, you know, this kind of thing. I think I. The book in Proverbs, that verse in Proverbs says, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. I talk it over with a few other people first before I did something about it myself, or this person will do that by themselves. So talk to other people about it first. Now also be careful of that, because you don't want to start a, start a problem too. You know, start people talking about a situation they would not have been aware of otherwise. So that's why you have to be real, real careful. Because you don't want to be guilty of that one verse in Proverbs that, uh, sowing discord among the brethren. Yeah. You want to be real careful of that too. God doesn't like that at all. Sowing discord among the brethren. But you want to be able to make the right choice if it is that serious and important matter like that. And then of course, pray about it. There's so many times that people have maybe asked me about things and I said, well, have you prayed about it? And the blank look on their face answers my questions. If they haven't prayed about it. Pray about it first. Even if it's real serious, pray and fast about these things. Because these are serious questions. These are serious situations here. So you want to be careful because you could start some problems that you sh should not have been started to begin with. Confidential things need to be kept confidential. Private things need to be kept private. Can you be trusted with a confidence? Like I said last Sunday night, we were talking about that. So that's a difficult question to rebuke a preacher or to... Bring it up to the preacher. Not rebuke him, but bring it up to the preacher. But if it really is a wrong doctrine, false doctrine, it needs to be dealt with somehow, some way. And, well, sometimes people just leave churches, too, because they're not teaching the right thing. I could mention a couple of doctrines tonight uh, that you'd be aware of. I'll bring up one, Calvinism. You know, I, we're not a, we, we don't, we believe Calvinism is a false gospel. Calvinism is a false doctrine. And if Calvinism would come into the church here, if I would start preaching uh, uh, Calvinism, I should be asked about that. At least asked about it. Because Calvinism is wrong. But that's one example. And there's other ones too. But that's a touchy situation. You need to handle it the right way. And I would talk to some other people about it first. People that you can trust with that confidence. Right. With that confidence. That they won't tell anybody else and won't start a problem in the church. They won't start a problem. Now, if it's a seriously wrong doctrine, then it needs to be confronted with, 
But usually the best way is just to leave the church if they're teaching a wrong doctrine like that. All right, next question. We got, we got a bunch of them tonight, too. That's why I'm kind of hurrying along here. Is it okay for a Christian to listen to classical music or jazz music besides, well, gospel music? Now, I have a hard time with this because I don't listen to music. I don't like to listen to music anywhere. Uh, at church, I like singing the songs. I like singing songs in church. But I don't listen to any kind of music outside there. So for me, it's a little bit difficult to get into this. Classical music, to me, is all right, but the only classical music I like is the William Tell Overture. <laughs> or something, you know, the Lone Ranger theme song. <laughs> that's the William Tell Overture. That's the only classical piece of music I like. I don't like listening to that. It's <laughs> boring. <laughs> Some of it's pretty. Some of it is, yeah. Jazz, I don't understand jazz. It's confusion. It has no, like, three beats per measure, four beats per measure. It's confusion. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 talks about confusion. Don't have confusion in the church. It, it's not, there's no two, you can't, you can't hum the melody of jazz songs. Right. right. Maybe that's the way to test it. Can you hum the melody of the, of the, jazz, of the jazz song? Is there a melody? There's not even a melody to it. The only jazz song I like, a little bit, I, I don't listen to it, years ago, is Dave Brubeck's Take Five. Some of you know that one, Dave Brubeck. Uh, that's the only jazz song I ever heard that I like a little bit, at least a little bit. Has a little bit of tune to it. I just kind of like that one. Well, that's the only one, the only one. Jazz is confused music. There's no tune to it. There's no steady beat, three beats per measure, four beats per measure. It even comes up to be like five beats per measure, which is a, a strange thing. It's not a natural beat, not a natural uh, rhythm to it. So I personally get into that real good. But I don't think jazz is helpful. I don't think it's restful. I, I think it uh, causes people to be nervous. Because there's really, it, it, it doesn't start, it doesn't end. There's no general beat to it, no right kind of beat to it. It's just different things. So like I said, I'm a hard one to ask because I don't listen to any kind of music here during the week at all. I go into uh, Office Max and they have music through the speakers. I wish somebody would invent some kind of earmuffs or something. Invisible where I could wear them in the office max. You wouldn't have to listen to all that music coming out of speakers. But so the only time I the only music I enjoy is singing congregational songs at church. That's it. So I'm kind of the wrong one to ask for this, but I don't think jazz is helpful. I don't think it's what would be the word? Uh, uh, anyways, I don't think jazz is, is good because it's confusing music. It's not basic three, four beats per measure and so forth. It's kind of confusing, confuses things. All right, like singing in church. Oh, here's another thing too to consider with this kind of music, maybe classical or jazz. How important is it? Could you give it up if you if you really, really felt convicted about it? Could you stop listening to it? Or are you addicted to it? Is it reached a place in your life where you have to listen to that music? You have to have it on all the time or much of the time? Consider that. Does it have a control over you? Anything that has control over you, beware of that. Don't let that happen. All right, next question here. Uh, you've preached on psychology in the past. Would you consider revisiting that topic for our church, seeing as biblical counseling is sweeping through churches today? It is sweeping through churches, not our churches. Years ago, it was a number of years ago, I really read a lot of books on that. I found it was so interesting. They had, of course, James Dobson was on, so-called Christian counselor. Uh, what was the, the two men? They had a radio program, too. They were real popular for a while. Uh, I can't think of their name. But I started listening to their, those programs, and I started thinking, they never talk about salvation. They never talk about, really, Jesus Christ as being your Lord and Savior. They never talk about that. And so I, I read a lot of books on it, wrote my own track. You, I looked at the track rack. It's, it's out about putting get more tracks in the track rack of a track I wrote years ago, comparing Bible counseling versus Christian versus worldly uh, psychology. I wrote a long track on that. I think a good track too. I think a helpful track. So deal with that. Get one of those. I'll I'll have them here for next Sunday. But they'll be in the track rack. Uh, but biblical counseling, it's. 
One time years ago, there was some couple coming to our church and they had some problems. They started going to a Christian counselor. So I wanted to get to know him, meet him, a nice guy and everything. But yeah, just he, he just doesn't, didn't have it right biblically. Just didn't have it right biblically. So be careful of this biblical counseling is called. They should, you know, the Bible here, Jesus Christ is called wonderful. What's the word after that he's called? Counselor. counselor. Who is the counselor? Jesus Christ. This is his book right here. Amen. That's all we need. You can make your life right through the Bible, the Word of God. Read the Word of God. Apply it where you need to. Apply it in the right way. Be careful. You go to those counselors, they don't use the King James Bible, do they? They just talk about the love of God. They talk about other things. Well, I'll give you, get a copy of my track there. I think that'll help you. <laughs> Sarcasm. In 2024, is, the, is 2024 the year you finally get, let BBT have a drum set? <laughs> and I think we all know the answer to that. And the answer is, no, no, no. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah OMDB, over my dead body. Yeah. That hasn't changed, by the way. In fact, I've added more things to that category, to that list. I've added more things to the OMDB also. But the psychology, be careful of that. Yeah, be careful of that. In the Bible, it says there's a false Jesus, there's a false uh, spirit, and there's a false gospel, too. Psychology is a false spirit. Psychology, for this reason, I'm, I'm talking about worldly psychology, or even so-called Christian psychology. It's a false spirit for this reason. It tries to give you the fruit of the spirit without being born again first. It tries to give you the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. It tries to give you all those things that, that the results of someone being born again and the Holy Spirit of God. That's called what? The fruit of the Spirit in the Bible. Those are the same things that counselors try to give to people without being born again, without Jesus Christ. A big difference there. A big difference. Important difference. As to who you're getting the, the, the right attitude, the... Uh, the right things in your life. Love, joy, peace, that comes from the Holy Spirit of God. To have the Holy Spirit of God, you have to be born again. Born again. And He dwells your body. He becomes inside of you in that way. All right, we're moving along pretty good. The next one, what upsets God more, divorce or a drum in church? See, people just don't like drum. What's with you, people? You don't like drums? <laughs> well, you can't, but I, I don't think you can compare the two, but they do have something similar, divorce and drum, you know what that is? Don't begin with the letter D. <laughs> They're more divorce or a drum. Divorce again, divorce happens. God hates divorce, but divorce happens and deals with it, forgives it too. So you have to have the right balance on that, as I said a little bit earlier. And a drum in our church, no, no, of course. Because that's just all rhythm. That's the beat, that's the carnal beat. The melody and harmony, melody is good, harmony is good. But when the drums are there and they, they have that, that rock beat. Now, by the way, with drums, like symphony, uh, timpani drum, is that what it's called, timpani? In, in, the, in an orchestra, that's okay, that's drums, but they're not predominant in the music. And a marching band, they have drums, and they're pretty strong sometimes, but it, it gives a different feeling, it gives, brings a different attitude uh, to, to the person. It's not a sensual beat, it's a military beat, patriotic beat, that's okay. The orchestra is, a, you know, plays the classical music or the, the music in the orchestra, and that's okay, but it's not, it doesn't emphasize the beat, and, and it's a different kind of rhythm. It's the rhythm that makes the difference. It's the rhythm of the song, be careful of the rhythm. And the rock, rock music drums, they use a completely different type of rhythm. It's not the rhythm of the marching band. It's not the rhythm of a symphony orchestra. It's a different rhythm, and the rhythm makes it bad. So, um, and divorce, again, that's a, 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 a subject that really, really has to be, have more information on. A uh, drum, a drum in the church. God, well, God even divorced Israel in the Old Testament. That's interesting. But divorce or a drum in the church. Okay. Yeah, it's meant to be kind of funny, and it was. They both begin with the letter D, so that's good. It's alliteration. Divorce, drum, okay. Next, oh, here's practical. I, I like these kind of questions. Will there ever be carpeting in the sanctuary? 
My answer to that is no, and here's why. Because I, we need to keep the acoustics in our in this yeah. laboratory best we can. Yeah. You put carpeting on, everything's soaked up. You have to have more microphones, you have to yeah. mic it sounds like you're, I don't know, like you're listening to a radio. It's it's not the same. So I like the sound vibrating back and forth a little bit, going up here. People come in and visit guest speakers we had, they go, wow, you have good acoustics here. And one preacher, one missionary from Vietnam, he was here one time, he came in here and said, wow, I want to preach here. I like those acoustics. They can hear that. He put carpet in there where it sucks everything up. And I just don't like it. Plus also, it's, it's easier to keep this clean than carpeting. Carpeting is a lot more difficult too. So, uh, no, we're not that carpet in the sanctuary. In fact, I balked a little bit of having the seat cushions put down. But everybody said, I'm tired of sitting on these hard bench seats. So we got the cushions there, we got the cushions there. But I like the acoustics, it helps so much for people to hear. Another question on the same page, will there be another men's Christian seminar? They have them off and on, but you know, I'm leery of speakers what they're going to say, what they're going to preach. I don't know if this is about bad with me, but I've, I've gotten more and more separate from so many different groups because I think they're going the wrong way. Yeah. The, the easy believism is coming around, the, uh, the music's turning over to Christian, uh, you know, contemporary oh, Christian right. music. I don't like that. I don't like when they put certain screens up on the front. That's a step towards that neo-evangelicalism. I just don't like, some leery of all those things. So if I could find one or somebody, we could maybe have our own men's seminar, but the only ones who come out to our men's seminar are you. So it'd be a, like another church service. So will there be another men's Christian seminar? You know the closest thing to it that I think would be good? Go to the Christian Law Association when they have their meetings, usually in October. That's over there, out there in Ashtabula, a Lighthouse Baptist Church out there in Ashtabula. I can recommend those, yeah. Now that's a legal seminar, it's not a revival, but I'm just leery. It has to be the right speakers, the right men that won't say something that I wouldn't agree with and I feel is important. And they're getting to be fewer and fewer all the time, sad to say. Next question, will there be a sermon or a meeting of friendship and meeting the right person to marry? That's always an important thing. You need to understand that uh, there's a, that subject, there's not quite enough for a full sermon on it. Although as important a subject as that is, you need to be able to meet the right person if, if it's for you. But remember this too, not everybody's meant to be married either. The Bible talks about that. Isn't it a curious thing, the Apostle Paul, it's not mentioned if he was ever married or not. He doesn't talk about himself. He talks about he was single as he wrote the Bible. We, we see several references there where he talks about, he says, don't we have the power to be about a wife and so forth, like, the, like Peter and others. So Paul, Paul said that. So it, he wasn't married at that time, but was he in the past? And he was a Pharisee, and one of the requirements to be a Pharisee, he had to be married. Be a, a Pharisee, he had to be married. So he was a Pharisee, so was he married? His wife left him because he got saved. It doesn't say it all. It doesn't say it all in the Bible. Real curious thing there. Next question. What is needed for Jeffrey to be ordained? Jeffrey Podolsky. Turn to Acts chapter 14, verse 23. Now, to be ordained, you have to be ordained for some reason. There must be a need. There must be a need. You have to need somebody. Brother Jeffrey, he's assistant pastor now. That's his standing. That's his position. And that's how we recognize him. He is a pastor, assistant pastor. But he's not ordained in the sense uh, that, that pastors get ordained. Because what he's doing now is uh, a lot. What he's doing now is, is a great help to me personally, too. It really is. And he's doing a great job with it. But to be ordained, ordained. If he would be uh, want to be a pastor, like a full-time pastor, then we would ordain him. Because he does qualify. He believes the right things. He believes the right Bible, yes. as you know. But to be ordained, Acts chapter number 14, verse 23. But you have to be ordained to do something. Not just be ordained to have a title. Uh, Acts chapter 14, verse 23. They were ordained here for a purpose, for a reason. And this might come up in the future. We might be able to do that. We'll see. We'll see. I'm not saying we shouldn't, but I'm saying it's... Uh, not needed right now because all he's doing right now he does not be, need to be ordained to do. 
Song leading, praying, preaching, all those different things. Acts chapter 14, verse 23. And when they had ordained them elders in the churches, see, they were ordained for a purpose, to be elders in the church, not just to have a title, but to be ordained for a purpose. And every church in heaven prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And so they ordained them for a purpose, because there was a need to be, uh, a need to be filled, a job to be done. Be an elder, pastor of the church, in this sense. They ordained the, the deacons there in Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 6, is it? Uh, chapter 6, I think, where they needed helpers, so they ordained the disciples to serve. But to put somebody uh, in a certain position, knowing what the responsibility is, and that then the church goes along with it. The church goes along with it. That's like an ordination there. So maybe in the future we will. We'll see how that works out. But in the meantime, he's doing a good job as assistant pastor. And all the people said, Amen. 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 All right, now let's see. There's still a few more here. All right, here's, a, here's the interesting. The Nephilim in the Bible. The Nephilim. Turn to Genesis chapter 6. It says, how did the Nephilim, Nephilim now there's a Nephilim and there's the Nephilims. They're real close. And what the spelling? Uh, let's see. The Nethanim, the Nethanims were those that helped the uh, Levites. They were servants to the Levites. They did real menial tasks around there, but that was their need. But then there was uh, the Nethanims, and let's see. I have a couple of different thoughts here. But Genesis chapter six will start here first. The, the main idea of this question: He says, Nephilim. How did the Nephilim return after the flood? After the flood. There were giants after the flood. How did they come back? Well, there were giants before the flood, too. So they came back the same way they came around before the flood. They were just part of the biological things going on. Adam and Eve having children, and then their children having children. And somewhere in there, the giants started out. They started. They weren't a special creation, but they came about through the natural biological things. Uh, of appropriation as God set up. Let's see, Genesis chapter number 6. After the flood. I had something else I wanted to bring up here too. Oh yeah, when there's questions about verses, two things in the Bible, if you can find a verse that teaches teaches very clearly, like I might say a definitive, a definitive verse or definitive statement. Something that makes something very clear. And one thing that's very clear is that God wiped out everybody with the flood. Every, everything died. Uh, except they were on the ark, everything else died. Of course, not the fish. Some of them survived and things like that. But everything died. So then afterwards, it talks about these Nephilim. But they, the word really means just giants, giants. There were giants before the flood. There were giants after the flood. And how did the giants after the flood come about? If everything got, if everything got destroyed on the flood, well, the same way the giants came about before the flood happened. Because Adam and Eve were created, and everything came out after that. So that must have been the biological a sequence there that the giants came about. They just came about, and then they multiplied too, as, as everyone does. So that happened before the flood, after the flood, through Noah's three kids, through his three sons and their families, Came up giants too. After a number of years went by, giants came up now too. Same way. Same way. Genesis chapter 6 and beginning verse 4. Here we go. There were giants, and the word, that word there, definitely means giants. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, they bare children to them. It seems like there was something wrong here. A bad sin taking place, maybe, maybe not. That's debated too. And again, don't, don't, uh, how do I say, base any, you, there's no important doctrine based on a spurious verse. Understand? There's no important doctrine based on a spurious verse. A uh, spurious means one that there's question about, you wonder about, is not real clear. When God wants to make something clear, He makes it clear. We're clear about salvation. We're clear about who God is. There's no, no uh, 
problems about that, understanding what it all means. God makes things very clear. Clear. If it's not clear, if it's vague a little bit, and you can't quite understand, that's all right. That's nothing important. Amen. It's not going to make a difference if you go to heaven or hell. It's not, not a heaven or hell issue. Yes. And there's some verses like that to make people kind of test them out. Well, you believe God even when you don't understand all everything about the Bible, every little thing in the Bible. Look what happened to Job. He didn't know what was going on. But how did he do? Well, he did question things. He did wonder about things. But for the most part, he did pretty good. In fact, I think Job did a whole lot better than I would have done in those kind of situations. So don't base a, a major doctrine on some spurious vague verse like this one is. But again, Genesis chapter 6. Stop talking and start reading, Pastor. Okay. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the Son of Man came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. Yeah. The same became mighty men, which are of old men of renown, powerful men, strange thing. And God saw that the wickedness of men, now this is connected with verse 4, and God saw that the wickedness of men was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts and of his heart was only evil continually. As the years went by, not one good thought in all these people that lived. Not one good thought. That's how bad they were. And then it says in verse 6, And repented the Lord that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him at his heart. God was grieved. Imagine that. God has emotions, doesn't he? It grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. So God says he can destroy everything. Verse 7 can be believed. He's going to destroy everything. There were giants of these Nephilim before the flood and they became after the flood. Why? The same way they got there before the flood, through the natural procreation of uh, Adam and Eve and their children, their children, their children. All right, there were giants after the flood. How did they come back? Yeah. Remember, there, there's the giants before the flood, and there's the giants after the flood, and then there's the New York giants, too. <laughs> all right, question number two. Do all, what do all the flags stand for behind the pulpit? You know, I'm not really sure. I know a couple of them, uh, but they do have, they're, they're marked, if you look at them along the site, where the pole is, you can see there the different countries there. But of course, they're different countries, ones that we have missionaries in. And I always like that. I always, and people notice that too. But I'm really not sure. If you want to look at them afterwards, you're welcome to come up and uh, look at them if you're not sure what some of the flags are. Number three, or another question here. Why did David choose five stones instead of just one? He was just going to face Goliath. Uh, it's only speculation. I've all, always heard speculation why he chose five stones. And one of the ones that makes the most sense and seems logical is because Goliath had five brothers. So he was ready to take them all out. Not just Goliath, but the five other brothers too. That's the only explanation I've heard over the years. It doesn't really say in the Bible. I was curious about numbers too. Number five, what, what does number five represent in the Bible? Grace. Salvation, grace, yeah. Grace, salvation. Five. Five stones, did that have anything to do with salvation? I don't know. But they say, like I say, what I've heard from many pastors means that they, Goliath had five brothers, so David was ready to take, take them all on. Take them all on them one day. So that's the best I can come up with for that one. The five, so why five stones instead of just one? Next question. Why didn't I hear anyone praying for Israel uh, during prayer and service? Should, should we not always pray for Israel? Yeah, we should. We should. We could add that to our prayer times to that, pray for Israel. I think we need to. I think people know what our stand is on Israel, too. We're for Israel. Amen. We are for Israel. And that's one of the issues I'll divide somebody on, because we've had people in our church here that, people that years ago that didn't like Israel. They didn't like, they thought Jewish people shouldn't be uh, prayed for. You know, they, they, they're critical of Jewish people in Israel in particular, too. I couldn't believe it. They seem like real good Christians, too. I, I thought they would really believe they were saved. I think they were. They passed away already. But I think about that. Why they wouldn't like Israel? I don't know. The Bibles couldn't be clear, I don't think. Yeah. Paul talked about Israel. We need to pray for Israel. We need to pray for them personally and the church, too. We can start doing that, yes. But there's also that, that word, real guilt written word, more. You know, you should pray. We should, we should be praying more. That, that word more, it's so guilt written. 
There's no end to that, too. But we do need to pray for Israel, absolutely. Because we are for Israel. 100%. Another question. Oh, yeah, this, this is a real good one. I like this one. How do you try to explain God to a toddler? Isn't that good? Uh, how do you explain God to a toddler? You know how you do that? You do it the best you can. Yeah. You explain that there is a God. That God is invisible. He's all powerful. He's the creator. You can talk to little kids. They, they, they can pick up on things. They're smarter than we think we, they are. They really are. Do the best you can. But here's another good way to teach uh, a toddler. By example. By example. Example's the best teacher. Come out to church. Be faithful. Come out to church. They'll, those, those toddlers, those young people, they'll see that. They'll see you coming out to church faithfully. And, and it registers that this is important that they believe this. As they get older and hear more and more all the time, they'll say, well, this is what my parents believe or whoever it is that's setting the right kind of example, church attendance, reading the Bible at home. See, my parents or whoever it was, this is important. They believe this. That's one of the best ways you can teach us, by example. And then, of course, just by teaching, try to explain it best you can to a toddler. All right, a couple more questions here. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 to 6. This is always an interesting one. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 to 6, talking about, well, I'll just tell you this quickly because our time is starting to get away here. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 to 6, it's talking about, Paul is, Paul is talking about somebody, if you could lose your salvation, could you get it back again? Hebrews chapter 6, now beginning in verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, now that doesn't, doesn't mean they're saved, enlightened, they were enlightened, they heard things, they went to Bible Baptist Temple, they heard the Bible taught, but they were enlightened, but they hadn't accepted it. They enlightened and have tasted. They haven't swallowed it. They just tasted of the heavenly gift. They didn't have the whole thing. And were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. They understood that they went to church. They sang the songs. And the Holy Spirit was here. Holy, Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit of God was blessing ser services. They were involved in those kind of services. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away, is it possible for someone who's saved to lose their salvation? No. No. It's not possible for someone who's really saved if they shall fall away. Paul's saying, if that person, if they were really saved uh, and they fell away to renew them again and to repent, could they be saved a second time? And the answer there is no. Paul's saying no. So that's always an interesting question, an important question too. Does this mean if you fall away, you were not saved? Yes. That's what it means. I wrote that one article. It was in that one of the newsletters a year, year and a half ago. Uh, used to be Christians. Used to be Christians. They used to read the Bible. They used to go to church. They used to pass out tracts. They used to sing in the church choir. Used, but they're not now and haven't been for years. What about those people? Well, here's the answer there. If God is not chastising them, then they were never saved. That's the key. Chasten them. God will chasten his children. If they're not his children, he won't chasten them. So that's a lot to say on that subject. Who's saved, who isn't, how uh, people drift away. Okay, just a couple more, I think. Well, yeah, two more questions here. In Genesis 1.26, God created man, male and female, on the sixth day. God created Adam's wife, Eve. Is it possible that God created men and women other than just Adam and Eve? Did God create other humans, people, uh, other than just Adam and Eve? My answer to that, very clear answer, it's, uh, uh, it's just one word. And the one word has two letters in it. Can you guess what that, the kids with the letter N, can you guess what that word is? No, no. If there was another creation or more people, even maybe before Adam and Eve, uh, there would be evidences of it. There would be geographic, not geographic, archaeological evidences of it, if there were. And you can't find that in the Bible anywhere. If it's not in the Bible, not in the Word of God, then, then uh, you know, don't believe fictitious things, too. But this is a curious question. You know why? Because it's coming up. People bring up these kind of questions. 
And we need to have a good Bible answer for that. And conspicuous by its absence. Isn't that a good way to say it? Conspicuous by its absence. Not in the Bible. That makes that says something too. When it's in the Bible, that says something. When it's not in the Bible, that says something too. Perhaps only Adam and Eve were placed in the Garden of Eden. Uh, but there were other men and women on the earth. No, no. There are the evidences of that, and the Bible would talk about that too and bring it up also. But that subject is coming up more often all the time because people are getting into unbelief. We found, actually Carol found something on the computer about a fable about two people, and their story paralleled Adam and Eve, but it's, uh, what is it, Hindu or Buddhism? I forget one of those two. Oh, so it was in psychology today. If you want to read that, but similar, but it's a fable, but how similar to Adam and Eve's story here, too, about those things. All right, there's a lot of questions there. Maybe some of them I didn't answer quite as well as I would like to, or maybe you still have some questions about them. Please talk to me about them. Be glad to do that. But my question is, we made it. I still want to have a type of invitation, too. So let's stand up, if you would. Uh, Carol will go to the piano and be ready to play for the invitation time. Yeah, Heavenly Father, I pray you bless now this invitation time too. Lord, it just was a good night. Good question. Good question tonight. Intriguing, thought provoking. Thank you for that. And biblical. And I pray maybe we've helped in some areas and straightened some things out. I pray we'll be able to uh, maybe deal with people more. There's still more questions. And there usually is. I pray that you'll bless now as we have a kind of invitation. Maybe something came up tonight that people want to pray about. Want to pray about it for themselves or somebody else. Or maybe someone wants to be saved tonight because they know they will need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So bless now this invitation time as we sing and we have offered the time that people come forward and pray about things. In Jesus' name, we pray and ask it now.